Welcome to another episode of the Robotics and Automation Podcast. We have today Andrea, CDO and founder of Synapticon. Thank you for having me. Welcome to the podcast. Synapticon has been quite disruptive in terms of the technology that it has developed during the last years. The server drives market has been quite traditional for the last 20 years, just having more and more drive for different power options, smaller drives. I would like to understand where this is coming from. Where did this idea start at Synapticon? It's an interesting story. Me and my co-founder are both coming from the mechanical engineering area. I have additional background in software technology. Before we started our company, we were dealing mostly with mechanical design. So our perspective on our products was always like, from the robot maker's view. So if I was a robot maker, what kind of piece of electronics would I wish for my design? This meant both in a sense of usability, but also in the sense of integration into the mechanical system. From the very beginning is always the customer's product in our mind, rather than our product um, becoming smaller, better, more sizes. We were trying to fit the product exactly into the application of our target customers. One thing is like the form factor, which is something that is very clear in the product range that Synapton has, the circular, and more recently the integral. But motion control is not just about form factor, but also about the features. So if we talk, for example, about Circular, what are these features that you developed, for example, for the specific robotic segment that you embedded in the drive? The approach is, what are the features really needed by the application? Generic servo drives need to fulfill various requirements, features for various markets and applications. We try to pick the distinct features that are important to our customers. And I will start with one of the more recent, let's say, releases. This was the safe motion functions of the Circular Series last year, which is something that was really a unique development made specifically for collaborative robot arms applications. It took us many years to design this software set, which comprises of more than 13 safety functions that allow robot makers to monitor the motion of the robot in a collaborative space, monitoring the speed, position, and torques and forces. So this is one of the largest newer packages we have been shipping. When it comes to uh, motion control, we have been focusing on following the standards, can open protocol and the profiles that are available for most drives. So to make our product easy to use and easy to integrate in existing infrastructure and then try to make most of it means still offer the most flexibility in what the customer can do with the data that they can retrieve from the drive and also what commands they can send to the drive. So it means switching between position or torque modes on the fly or maybe establish zero gravity mode with their robot. So it's always in the focus of the customer, but still keeping the standard protocols, which is very important. Companies when choosing server drives, there have been like a list of topics that they are sometimes worried about when they choose a drive. One of them, for example, is the frequency for the control loops. How is Synapticon solving that? How are you working in that terms to provide the precision, the control that companies need in robotics? Yeah, so in motion control, really it fascinate me, fascinates me still today is that we are still learning a lot every day, even though we are in the business since around 10 years. It's a fact that every component can be a bottleneck for the performance of the system, starting from the encoder, the measurements, and then ending with the real-time communication. And everything in between is what we call the server drive. So of course, the frequency at which the server drive operate need to be maximized, but of course also kept at a reasonable level to keep down the heat and the size of the processors used. I think the secret here is to have the right balance of a good sensor a good drive operating at decent frequencies. And then of course, a set of functions to reduce the noise of the sensing, for example, feedback filters that can be adjusted by the user to the respective sensing system and to the respective application. Yeah, here again, getting the balance of performance is about the ability of the user to set these filterings and these adjustments. At what frequency are the server loops running on uh, Synapticon Drive? On our 
most recent generation of products, the control loops for current and torque are running at 16 kilohertz, while the other loops are running at around 4 kilohertz. Some of the internal filters for encoder feedbacks are running at 32 kilohertz, in fact. Yeah. Does a higher server loop, for example, for the torque or current loops provide greater performance? Because some companies are advertising 40, 80 kilohertz current control loops. Yeah, it's true, especially for very tiny motors. Uh, may, you might uh, want to have even higher frequencies. At the moment, Synapticon is focusing on motors around 150 watts and above. So I think in this area, um, typical frequencies would be 16, 32. Uh, we are operating in 16, and the question is why not higher frequency here. Our torque control and current control approach is model-based. This means we calculate the motor model in real time based on user input from the data sheet of the motor and also some internal measurements. This means we are able to predict the motor's behavior in the next control cycle and hit our target current right away. This means we don't need to correct so many times. And this gives us the advantage of keeping the switching losses lower and also have more time to compute other things in our drive. Okay, that makes sense. Synapticon has coined this term that is integrated motion. I understand that this is quite useful for people that are developing cobots or any kind of robot. They don't have to be putting all these parts together. But a lot of times these companies that are developed by a robot, they choose different components because they need to fit exactly what they need for each axis. Is this not a challenge for someone choosing Synapticon that it's a selected encoder, selected uh, brake, selected? How did you solve this? This is also the difference maybe between a PC and a laptop. I would say the world will always need a PC for the gamer, for the pro CAD user, for the enthusiast, but still laptops today are dominating the world. And of course, it wasn't easy to make such a product. Making a fully integrated device means pushing all the technology required to the edge to achieve the best balance of quality, cost, performance. So we need to make, of course, some compromises, but we are trying to achieve a balance that will serve the vast majority of our customers. The ob obvious benefit of this is the cost reduction, complexity reduction, reliability will increase with the reduction of number of components. And of course, ease of use, a fully integrated system doesn't require too much commissioning and, and tuning effort, which nowadays is becoming harder and harder to get qualified engineers to, to do these kind of tasks. In fact, all this motivation to do so comes from our personal original expectation. As a mechanical engineer or software engineer, I was always, as a young, young engineer, I was expecting that servo drives and motors are something that is long solved. So I would just buy it, connect it to my laptop, write a Python script, send the trajectory to it, and it will, mercy, it will execute the trajectory perfectly right away. And uh, nothing can be further from the truth. Today, servo systems are usually selected, sized, and uh, adjusted by experts who, let's say, there are experts are needed to actually do, which is, let's say, I would say, somehow limiting the pace of innovation in all the industries that we are addressing. Uh, in fact, in robotics and machine building, the same issue has, exists that people really want to build machines and robots and not to deal with encoders. Of course, you said in the beginning, most motion systems are carefully designed to their purpose. And there are still cases in some high-end applications where this might be necessary. And uh, our answer is to this, that our product, even though being integrated, always support, let's say, external encoder interfaces to enable some very high accuracy applications. For example, the new product Integro now, even though it's fully integrated in the motor, has an external interface for N.2.2 and 3.0 protocols from Heidenhain to, in these cases, allow our customers to put a very high resolution sensor still in the, as a second sensor to the loop to still achieve uh, excellent performance in some high-end applications. If I was developing my own robot actuator machine, there is always this debate between DIY and buy the component. When do you think it's more suitable DIY and when to buy? Yeah, that's a very good question. It's uh, also a 
entrepreneurial question and also a technical question. So, like I said, we, of course, try to make the perfect product that people can buy for certain applications. On the other hand, the technology for motion control has been democratized more and more in the recent years to the rapid development of semiconductors, microcontrollers, sensors, real-time communication protocols. So, of course, it's uh, possible to make great developments by yourself. On the other hand, the, let's say, requirements for reliability certification in terms of both safety certification and also uh, other types of certification for the global markets, uh, for example, in the US would be the UL certification or similar other certifications for different regions is also increasing. There is, of course, this question, how long would it take to get all these things done and what is going to be the benefit in the end? Yeah, I think there is always going to be applications where DIY is um, a good choice, but we're always going to be awake and watch these applications. And if these applications become more and we see another niche that we would like to cover, we would like to, of course, provide a standard answer to this question. Traditionally commissioning an actuator with a server drive, brakes. In the beginning, you had this computer program where you just type in registers, which was very complex. Then we had more advanced software where you can see you have scopes, you have maybe in half uh, model identification, tuning. How is Synapticon doing it compared to the traditional way? Yes, I think the, 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 we don't want to hide things from the user. Still, of course, we don't. We believe our customers knowledgeable, smart. They want to know what's happening inside a product. On the other hand, we want to offer a, a user interface that makes it super easy to get to the to a solid result without needing to in a guided way and i think the best and uh, most effective co uh, concept here is providing wizards that will guide you step by step and also give you some suggestions and tips i think where our future will lie when it comes to how to further develop th this kind of helpful software is to have application specific wizards for example for particular types of robots particular types of applications we would have set up wizards we are working on currently that will really focus on the most common pitfalls in setting up a servo system. I think a servo system has around 400 parameters in its in, uh, that you can adjust, which sounds like a vast number. Of course, mostly you need only 25% of them and the rest is just not relevant for you and your application. Even these 25% is too much. In my opinion, it should be just a matter of few steps. Is Synapticon compliant with DS402? Yes, we from the very beginning, Synapticon tried to avoid any proprietary. So our tuning tools, commissioning tools, speak to our drives through the CanOpen protocol, regardless of what the graphical user interface is doing. Let's say if it's a tuning or it's a calibration of an encoder, for example, still everything is running through CanOpen, it's transparent, which is also very helpful because our customers are mass producing actuators for their robots and in their production lines, they want to do automatic commissioning without using any graphical user interface so they can fully access um, all these functions through the CanOpen interface. So it's not only about the motion control and compatibility with PLC, but also transparency when it comes to production and quality control. Until now with configuration tools, you have from the people that are buying, for example, motor and server drive from the same brand, and you just almost plug it and it works, the big manufacturers. And then you have the people that is building their own, they putting the color from one brand, the motor from the other, the brake. And then you have to go through the data sheet, see how do you connect it, configure if it's an absolute protocol, configure it on the server drive. How does it work with Synapticon? Because you have everything integrated. Yes, there is for our drives with integrated encoder let's say you have the option to automatically configure it so you don't need to configure it it's already pre-configured you might need to calibrate the encoder only to the mechanical misalignment of the shaft for example but when it comes to external encoders and motors we have introduced a motor and encoder database recently to our software where we have actually motor and encoder data in the database that was verified with respective manufacturers. For example, 
We have popular brands like Cole Morgan or TQ, RoboDrive in our, in our database. And we didn't just copy the data sheet values, but we actually were collaborating with these companies, talking to their application engineers, engineering about what would be the sensible setting for every particular motor actually. So we found actually we can get more performance out of these motors by talking to them and, for example, allowing a bit more current for a particular model than the datasheet would suggest. If you have a big machine or, for example, a cobalt which has seven axes, how do you access the drive when it's built into the machine? To do any configuration or, or tuning for one axis, which is when you have a seven axis, the tuning will depend also on the position of the other axis. How do you solve this? Yeah, generally in motion, first I would say that the overall system performance, the main bottleneck is the performance of a single actuator. It's just that if you have an excellent uh, actuator design with a nicely tuned control loop, a good uh, feedback system, you will be having a much wider space for a uh, solution to the multi-axis control means the better the single axis control is the easier will be get uh, to find a solution for the multi-axis so that said first i think everyone should focus on the single actuator being done a uh, single actuator being uh, properly designed then in the multi-axis setting everything else is easy then so now there are some cases where having a single axis um, um, actuator uh, design done very well still is not enough to achieve dynamics, uh, especially in the kind of dynamics applications, is not achievable by just sending a position trajectory to the drive. For that, we do have a feed forward built in the drive, but we also support the feed forward through the network's dynamics models computed by the robot controller can then feed forward the torque and velocity on the fly through EtherCAT with frequencies up to four kilohertz. This means there is no solution in the drive by itself to the dynamics. It's just that the drive allows you to boost the performance through the feed forward pads. There is a built-in feed forward that can be enabled by default, uh, which will also in most simple applications have a big difference on your, okay. make a huge difference to your Other providers in this space, because they also provide motion controller, they can have tuning of the whole system, like for a cobot and dynamics. Is this a problem in terms of for synaptic? Yeah, so um, I think the most robot controllers on the market, there are not so many, off-the-shelf robot controllers that are suitable for high-performance applications. I am not. I would not say that Cobot, as an application, is a high-performance robot application in terms of uh, dynamics. But let's focus on the standard robot controller. Most, if not all, standard controllers I know do support feed-forward mutation on the fly and <coughs> taking advantage of our standard. Pro Okay, so you can just use any motor robot controller that is yeah, available. Yeah, I would say started from, starting from a common industrial motion controller, a PLC, maybe like a back of Twinket NC, NC controller, they would offer a feed forward, for example, and would be a total no-brainer to actually set the system up. Here again, following the standards for following the state of the art is the most clever way, yeah. Okay. Why something that I am surprised, especially with robot arms, many of them still have the server drives in a box on the side of the robot. Why do you think it is that? Good question. Actually, in in the collaborative robots, usually drives vast majority of robots have their drive integrated. In the industrial robot, the vast majority of robots have their drive in the cabinet. So, what is the big difference between these two types of robots? Is it only historical or is it technical reasons? And it's a mix of both. I would say at the time where industrial robots were invented and became very popular, there was no real-time networks like EtherCAT available. So many of the many parts of the system were analog. For example, resolvers are used for feedback still today in some high-end robotic systems and the data processing this analog data is done in a central box where all the lines will come together 
So there are some historical reasons, uh, but there is also one more reason why the cobot or let's say the modern robots and service robots have their drives integrated is that they have a variety of sensors that classical robots don't have. Is that industrial robot usually has one encoder or one resolver per motor, while in cobots usually uh, you have two encoders, you would maybe have a torque sensor even, and all in the same place, and then you have seven axes, and then taking all these cables and guiding them through the robot structure to the cabinet would be a very, let's say, uh, tedious task and maybe a not very reliable system. Yeah, I would say I would categorize it in these two groups. Why do you need two encoders for a robotic axis joint? This, the, the, there's many answers to this question. There's many reasons to have two encoders. So first reason is that the types of gearboxes used in these lightweight designs have a fairly flexible structure, which means controlling the a smooth motion trajectory and a dynamic motion trajectory can prove difficult with this flexibility. So having a secondary encoder, or we call it actually the primary encoder, <laughs> which is measuring the true joint position can be helpful to increase the performance. The other convenient thing is, let's say, a byproduct of this that we automatically have a redundancy. We have two encoders, means we can build redundancy for functional safety. We can take advantage of that. And then in some of these robots, the dual encoder system is used also to detect collisions and measure torques. The torsion in the, this flexible gear can, together with two measurement devices, can be used as a simple yet effective uh, force uh, or torque sensor. Is, is this something new or is this something that many companies are using already? I think it's not new, but it's not so many companies who use it already. So that I think the idea exists since a long time. As far as I remember, since we started a company, this idea existed. And yes, later this year, there will be some announcement in this direction from our side. We are working on some standard algorithms to, to that will do some virtual torque sensing, which will enable for basic torque sensing function used for hand guiding and some, some let's say, common, common torque force applications in cobots. As a mechanical engineer yourself, you have already built uh, robots. What do you think are like the top three features, functions that make your life easier when building a robot? That's such a... You, you will be surprised about the answer. I think as a mechanical engineer, really a servo drive uh, or an encoder is just another piece of equipment you're installing into the structure. Actually, the software person will then need to deal with the features of that drive. But as a de designer of the robot, the only thing you really care about is the gearbox, the torque of the motor, the brake, you're designing these parts and you're making an assumption that the drive you're using will be able to take full advantage of this mechanical structure. So that's the first thing. This is how I'm imagining uh, as a mechanical engineer. And then the rest becomes like cabling, cooling, form factor. Okay, can I build my robot sub modules can i manufacture them separately fully test them and then assemble a robot system and have a low probability of having a failure in, in the final assembly these are the things that a mechanical engineer a professional engineer who has manufacturing experience is really concerned about we have been in the past as an engineering company in the past of synaptic on designing some robots and even planning production lines for these robots and believe it or not, the idea for the Circulo as a product, our product Circulo, came from one of our engineers who was uh, designing a robot for a customer and was planning the production line and figured out that he really needs to assemble the actuator in a separate station, fully test and calibrate it, and then put it together for a robot. He doesn't want, he didn't want to risk that in a final assembly of a, such a complex machine, one piece is going to prevent him of producing uh, the piece till the end. So you need to stop the production of this unit until the issue was figured out, uh, which is a big risk. 
Yeah, so it's a funny question. It has nothing to do with the actual drives features inside. So this is the mechanical engineer's perspective. Now for the software engineers or the roboticists' perspective is very different. Roboticists want to have full control and transparency over the data uh, that is uh, available inside of the drive. They would want to have all of it at the robot controller side because they know what they're doing and they know what they want. So here, high frequency communication, low latency, access to all the parameters is key. And then there is the commissioning engineer who wants to set up. They don't want this complexity. They want a simple step-by-step -step process to set up the drive. So we have really different stakeholders having completely different expectations from a servo drive. Mechanical, let's say, technician who is commissioning, electrician, and then the software engineer. Okay, going from Circular, Synapticon, last year at SPS announced a new product which is integral, which looks like a completely different market, very far away from all these nice and sexy robotics. Where is this coming from? What's the story? Yeah, Integro in, in many senses is very similar, but also in terms of the market and application, very different project. How it started is that five or six years ago, when we only had the Node series, the generic compact servo drive, already some machine builders from our local market in Germany have approached us and were amazed by the small size performance and features in this small package, right? And they haven't seen such small drives or haven't been familiar with this kind of technology coming from robotics. This technology was coming from robotics and they wish to have this kind of density of performance and feature features in their machines. So they asked for taking these electronics and putting it in a classical standard uh, servo motor and at that time, we were just starting to design the circular series, which was made for the lightweight robot uh, market. So we hadn't had a time to, or the capacity to design both products at the same time. We carefully noted all these requirements from machine builders, and we had like further conversations with these customers over the years. So this specification was growing slowly. We have been also we have been also successful with, in some cases, with integrating the standard Somanet node into uh, standard servo motors, and through this experience we would we were able to collect further requirements. But the wish to do to make this product existed already five to six years ago because it, we felt that the it could change the motion control market. It is a challenging design, but it could change it. So yeah, it started many years ago. And finally, when Cirque Safe Motion was announced, which was the final big element of this development, we focused our entire team on the R&D team, let's say on the new product development. So now it has been around two years that we are working on Integra series and we are about to enter serial production late this year or beginning of next year. So it has been a very interesting journey. So yeah, question is why enter motion market, general motion control market? The market size and the business opportunity is the main answer. There is many more applications, a vast amount of applications that can be covered with such a generic product. But I would say also the requirements are also more difficult in terms of robustness, in terms of reliability, also various communication protocols, various encoder requirements, let's say, for example, battery-free multi-turn is a big requirement for some applications like logistics or packaging a machine industry. So we needed to collect all these technological pieces and put it together it's because our vision here is to really have one generic device that can cover, again, not all, but the vast majority of applications. What are the power ranges that Synapticon Integro is going to be covering on, on the real estate? The first launch will be uh, covering a rated power of around 1.6 kilowatts of continuous power and will be able to go up to three times that for short time, let's say up to five to 10 seconds for accelerating uh, high loads. So we are speaking about the largest size of Integro will have 120 amps RMS 
which is a very high number for the peak current and this peak current will be available for five to ten seconds so still very usable power so on the test bench it would correspond to something like five or six five to six kilowatt on the shaft on the mechanical shaft of the motor Have there been any technological advancements that enable this kind of power in such a small device was this possible five years ago yes the additional challenge let's start with the challenge and then with the solution the challenge is that integro as a, a product was meant to is made to be integrated into a servo classical servo motor and the Servo motors are rated at around 20 to 140 degrees Celsius in the winding, or which is also similar on the outside, the motor body will have a similar temperature, somewhat lower. So now designing a piece of electronics that will be bolted on the back of the hot motor and still operate at these high powers was the main challenge of this project. So we set off to by saying either we are going to make a drive that can live with these high temperatures or we are not going to make the product because either we are going to keep the power rating of the motor same or we are not going to go to this market and because the main one of the main disruptive factors of this product is to keep the compact form factor of the motor so this is this was the big challenge for the team and now the answer is like the advancements. So I would say one strong base for the success is the thermal design of this product. So we started uh, six months, six months before starting to really work on the PCV design and mechanical design. Six months before we started with thermal simulations, extensive thermal simulations of the system to see how we can figure out a concept to to withstand these high temperatures and still achieve the industry standard lifetime expectation of our, uh, which is around 20 to 40,000 hours of operation. So, so I would say the foundation here is the engineering skill in the thermal design. Then, of course, there are some also technolo technologies that have been used that haven't been available maybe or haven't been used by us before some advanced PCB technologies like that enable for higher copper density to transfer to transfer the heat out of the switching devices on the power stage. But to be honest, I don't like talking about too much about the, let's say, recipes of how Integro became what it became. It's still too early. I understand this is low voltage drive, but most of the motors available in the industry right now are AC. The low voltage motors are AC because they're three phase. But yes, I get your point. The if you look at the entire servo market in terms of the numbers and the number of the quantities of motors in certain power and torque ranges, we would see that between a power of 250 watts to one point six two kilowatts we will have around 60 percent of the mark, uh, market okay. covered so of all servo axes ever sold so there are of course certain limitations there are still the 40 percent market in the high power segment and the very tiny or let's say miniature uh, drives but obviously synapticon coming from the low voltage technology we were curious to see what can we do with this uh, knowledge we have in the industrial space and we were after looking at the data, surprised how much can be done immediately. And then the different realization we had is that there is actually a gap right there between the drives that go from one kilowatt, kilowatt and above and drives that are operating at 500 watts or less. Even though majority of the quantities is right there with watt and one kilo, there is just there is, this is usually the border where you either need to use some very compact drive technology or you need to go to the high voltage AC drives. And we, with Integro, we expanded the low voltage power range to its maximum. Like I said, 120 amp in the very tiny box. I argue we can do even more, but it's not sensible for the cables that are used to transfer the power on the DC side. And then we extended the low voltage on the top, and then we will also in the future have also smaller versions of the Integro. So covering everything, let's say from a very tiny 100 watt motor to 1.6 will already take more than 60% of the market. The, we 
believe we found a market gap that we can fill. So it's more like a marketing question than a technology question, if AC or DC. I think AC and DC really makes no big difference for the customer. As long as we bring all the answers, like how to install, let's say, a DC system, like the power supply, the cabling and the sizing. So with Integro, we plan to offer a full set of power supply units and cables. This means that customer doesn't need to think much about the transition from AC to DC. They will just pick from the catalog this and we will help them size the size the drives properly. Another issue that I see a lot of times when companies transition from the cabinet to distributed drives is that you may have one 10, 100 watt motors, five, 500, one kilowatt, a couple of them. And for each one of them, you have to choose one specific part number because it has a current sense, a current range for sensing, which you need to fit with each motor. Has Synapticon, do you have a workaround around this or do you need to order one part number for each current range for different motors? The Integra series has two sizes. So one is going up to 60 amps RMS. This is the smaller size and the larger one for 120 amps. So these two systems have different hardware, but each the current sense technology meantime that we are using is capable of measuring currents accurately down to a motor with a rating of less than one amp, even though at the same time it can measure currents up to 60 amps RMS, which corresponds to 80, 90 amps uh, on the phase. Yes, there have been massive improvements on the current sensing capability of our drives in the Integro series. We use a very different approach than before, which involves better current sensors, but also a more a better software, a better software approach to the oversampling and then increasing the accuracy and the resolution of the current. Okay. What do you think are the applications that will benefit the most for Integro? There is several applications we believe are most, let's say, integrated is particularly valuable. So one would be the intralogistics. Let's start with this one, which is maybe not expected. Intralogistics would be anything from a mobile battery driven uh, mobile robot, but also all kinds of, let's say, tasks around the robot, starting from simple things like conveying, lifting, and moving things. Why benefit from the integrated is that you don't have the space, you don't want the number of cables everywhere to explode. So it's traditional servo technology is just too complex for these kind of logistics scenarios. And so simplify installation, increase reliability, that, that's the things that our customers are concerned in intralogistics and functional safety is important um, in mobile robots. And this coming in a nicely integrated package that is plug and play is of course a big thing. Then multi-axis motion control in a classical machine building where we have serial kinematics or Cartesian kinematics with many motors in a single chain with our new single cable technology that we have designed for Integro, we can have a single cable transfer power and real-time communication and safety through, through the same connector. So if you look at a Cartesian robot, let's say it could be a three to six axis Cartesian system, we can now implement everything with a single cable. And then the whole Cartesian system can be fully commissioned and tuned and there will be only one cable coming out of the, this module, let's say. So when this Cartesian system is put in a larger system, the only thing you need to do is just plug this one cable in and the system will run. As opposed to the classical cabinet technology, you would need to install these drives into your customer's cabinet. So you need to plan months in advance uh, where to find a space for them, how to do the air conditioning, uh, how to do the cabling and then you, you will bring your Cartesian system to your customer and then take days to install it and then of course have the risk that it doesn't work as uh, expected because you have now a different installation that might lead to some trouble. So machine building, the modern machine builders are very concerned about throughput in their production. So they want their modules to be self-contained uh, but they don't want every machine module to have a big cab a cabinet to it because this would explode the cost. So now what uh, they imagine and what was the feedback like years ago is that they want a module fully tested 
that is then becoming part of a larger system which maybe has a very simplified cabinet to connect all the modules together. So it's a bit similar to the robotics, what we said that single fully tested actuator is important to ensure, let's say, seamless production without any friction, a seamless production of serial robots. And now we're talking about serial machines. So some of these target customers, we're talking about producing multiple hundreds of machines, which each has 20 to 100 axes. Okay, so we have hundreds of machines per year with hundreds of axes. So it's really a production line type approach. And for that, you really uh, need every subsystem to work seamlessly before it's put together. And this is where cabinet free technology excels because you can pre-test and pre-commission a full module and uh, after that it's just putting the cables together and done. When I think about Cartesian or Gantry applications, it can be like pick and place, it can be, but also a lot of them can be dusty. You can have water, you can have liquid, you can have lasers. What is the IP protection of the integral? So Integral by default comes with IP65 and there is also an IP69 option okay. with the hybrid cable. So we have a very high IP rating here. We operate, we rate the drive at 40 degrees environment air temperature, which is typically industrial, despite the 140 degree motor temperature I mentioned. So it's a very robust product made for used in a relatively harsh industrial environment. Which, where we also expect dust and sugar, for example, in the production of sweets to build up on the housing of our product and even reduce its thermal capabilities over time. This is, for example, why the integral design on the outside is smooth, doesn't have any, any cooling fins or ribs. Many heat sinks to in increase their surface area have like complex structure or let's say fins. Integral doesn't have them, and you would ask why. That's why. Tricky question. Tri <laughs> what about food and beverage? Because right now I understand it's an aluminum housing, mm -hmm. but probably for that industry you'll need still steel. At the moment, we don't have a food grade design for the Integra series. Our next answer to this kind of application would be having a nearby variant of Integral. Nearby means installed still in the field as an IP65 to IP69 but connected to an, a motor, which is maybe a stainless steel design. This additional variant of Integra will come out next year, will enable to keep the same system, same software, same cabling, and have any motor, regardless if it's integrated or nearby. Okay, interesting. So we have talked about Integra, we have talked about Circular. What about the future? We have there is a huge hype now on AI. There's a huge hype on human and robot. It's like the, the big trend now. What are the next trends that you see coming into the robotics and industrial automation market? Yeah, so first of all, the history and the foundation of Synapticon was always related to the vision of a humanoid robot or a service robot in every home. So our vision was to be the facilitator of the development of these kind of systems. So this was the very first mission of the company. And then along the way, we have been designing products that are more in the present, fulfilling the needs of the currently most commercially strongest markets. Still, the original vision exists to be there for the robot makers when the let's say market of service robotics takes off and we our products today are being used in service robots as well but we are still see we have many ideas and concepts we are working on already to double down on the service robotics and the humanoid robotic hype is it really a hype that's a good question i think it is a hype but it's something that is here to stay i don't think humanoid robots are going anywhere they are going to stay popular for a long time as I believe our fascination with the humanoid robot as a concept is just too large. Mm -hmm. And the passion of the, our passion for this topic is just too large and the technology has advanced so much, starting with the mechanical and the motion control uh, design with, with the wa basic walking has been mastered by several companies, even more than basic walking. Um, all combining this with the uh, advancements in AI really 
makes everyone see the light at the end of the tunnel because it's a very long way to build a, such a complex robot system but people are really hopeful that we will have useful service ro com humanoid service robots pretty soon so there's large investments and we are also willing and ready and prepared to invest ourselves in components and new approaches for these markets so yeah so i we have all seen all those amazing demos by Boston Dynamics and companies like this, which was using hydraulics until very recently. Once you start seeing demos which are electronics based, then everything gets incredibly slow. For example, the DARPA challenge, it's incredibly slow, all the robots moving around. Is it a limitation of actuators that are available today, the technology? Is the limitation of the software also? I would say it's a very hard question. So the certainly Boston Dynamics choice for hydraulics was driven by the sheer power or the force density that can be achieved with the hydraulic system. I'm not certain about it, but I guess that the hydraulic systems might not be viable cost-wise uh, as a long-term solution. This is why, uh, and the control is maybe more difficult than electri electronic drives or let's say electrical drives. Now, trying to achieve the same level of dexterity with an electrical, electrically driven robot is probably a challenge. I'm not an expert on humanoid robot dynamics, but Seeing some of the robots, like, for example, Agility, Agility Robotics from the US, you can see they have a very lightweight design that also seem to be moving very dynamically due to its extreme lightweight structure and purpose-made gear, gears and purpose-made motors. So I think there is a long way in what can be done with electrical drives. We are definitely not at a moment fully leveraging the potential. I would say we are just at the start. There have been many humanoid robots with electrical drives in the past, but the focus of these projects was not necessarily to beat Boston Dynamics, because even the Boston Dynamics robot, the amazing demos with the dynamic movements are not older than maybe 10 years. So many of these electrical robots were just trying to walk, <laughs> do the basics. But now I think that engineers feel challenged by what Boston Dynamics has shown um, with hydraulics. And also we will see some new genius designs, even with electrical systems. And this would also mean new gearbox, new motor designs. Because for example, in most of these robot joints, what I see is they're normally using harmonic or cycloidal gearboxes, but this has a high inertia. So changing directions, it's complex, right? Yes, and also friction is a big point, but you will see, or we will see completely different gear types and also different gear ratios. Uh, you will see a mix of different gear types, like also planetary gears, also cycloidic gears, and harmonic or let's say strain wave gears, all combined in the very same robot even for different tasks. I think the strain wave gear has this kind of excellent lightweight design, which is basically unthinkable with another gear principle. But then we have some high efficiency planetary gears can be used also for some joints. So I think we will see a variety of ideas there. And I'm certain that the performance of these electrical robots will increase a lot in the next few years. I expect to have massive strides in, in performance improvement. One last question, which has brought new technology to, to the market, a very different approach to designing products, but something that I've also felt talking with you, with Nick, is about culture. There is a big change in how the company has been built and with the team. How are you doing it? Yeah, maybe you should tell me what change you're referring to. <laughs> There's maybe ch many changes, both in, both in the organization as maturing the company and still keeping some of the original culture and the enthusiasm about uh, designing products. The company started with the vision we still 
maintain today uh, that I mentioned before. But along the way, we needed to do many things to maintain the company alive. To We, we were doing engineering services, financing our I ideas and products for the robotics applications through other activities. And then we decided to go for product only and invited. So we were fortunate to find investors to support this new strategy. And this is where everything became very serious about product uh, development. So we became really a product company. And the, today, I would say we are in a stage where we are maturing as a company, as an organization by itself, regardless of the product. So it means being able to deliver, continuously deliver the expected quality and service to our customers. And, and on the other hand, try to keep the innovation going. And our, two years ago, approximately, we have established research and pre-development team under my management, which is exploring the technologies that we requ would require for the next generations of our existing product lines, as well as exploring innovations in different directions that we already spoke about before in the direction of, for example, humanoid or surgical robot applications, as well as some other industrial applications. So we needed to put together a new team that has a bit more freedom, still very customer focused, but has more freedom to, to try things out. And even if these things fail, it's important to maybe, if we see it failing, to stop it early enough, not to waste further time. So some of our projects go like only two weeks. Okay, we would design a new encoder concept and we just scrap it within 10 days because we just figure out that the technology really will not give us benefit. And in the standard R&D roadmap, it's more linear. We need to follow our roadmap very strictly. So we have to pre-qualify everything and doesn't leave a lot of room for changes. So we have, you could say now, an organization which can do both, still deliver quality, reliability, the certified products, and on the other hand, maybe be even faster than ever in innovation. Yeah. So I, I believe we, in the following years, we will have even more innovations than what we uh, could have been doing in the last five to six years. Synaptagon has a quite a big development team, and we are in an era where it is difficult to find talent in this space. How are you doing it? to be able to gather all this talent together. Yes, one important thing is that we are very open to to recruit people from anywhere in the world to come to us or even world work remotely for us. We have been open from the very beginning because from the very beginning it was a challenge to assemble a team of people required for our mission. So this openness remains and is the key, I believe, and then of course, the culture of the company, I, I, I hope, works for us, is that we really listen to our colleagues and everyone is heard, everyone ha has the, an, an opinion and can influence the development of company. In fact, not, not only they can, but they actively encourage to do. And this is something that may, some companies might not be able to offer. The unique culture of our company is the key to attract people who really want to change things and move things. And really, we are interest, interested in the very same type of people. I would say these are the openness and also the, the culture of the open culture inside of the company is a key to, to get the right people in. What are the key things that you look for when you're trying to get a new Synapticon on board. Good question. There's uh, different positions require different qualities. Different... On your team. I still myself look for a certain entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah. yeah. We imagine our company, like everyone who starts at Synapticon, in my mind, will potentially become a leader of a small sub team or, an, or, or division of our company when the company grows. So we're trying to find this first guy, this one guy or one girl that will be in charge. They want to be in charge. Yeah. On the other hand, also wants to get their hands dirty in the early days and have the patience because entrepreneurship is also about having patience. Patience about having resilience also. I'm not really endlessly patient, of course, but I would say 
being ready to do the work first and then manage the work and then grow with the organization. So still we are in a phase where in every single person we, that is joining in us, we see a potential department leader or a team leader for most positions, not for all, but for most. And I think it's a natural thing for entrepreneurs to look for people that are like, which on the other side, I must admit in the recent years, I also see is also sometimes necessary to think differently about different positions. Yeah, I think it's a never ending story on learning how to recruit the right people. It's a really interesting and challenging task. I believe we can say that Synapticon has been a very successful project from its start. And right now it's well known in, in, in Europe, in the US, in, in Asia. From your point of view, what have been the key elements for yourself? And I know that here we can get survivorship bias, but what do you think are the key thinking elements or attitudes that have helped you to be successful at Synapticon? You mean me per personally? Yeah, myself. Ah, myself. I think first admitting your own mistakes, learning from them, fixing them without waiting. I think this is something that can never be underestimated how much you can improve in this regard. You have to, and also not, also not just because you failed once, with a very similar idea <laughs> doesn't mean that the fixed version of this idea will not be massively successful. <laughs> sometimes a small adjustment makes a huge difference. And sometimes you need to fight. If you really believe that this adjustment will make a difference, you need to properly argument it, bring a proper argument to explain it to the rest of the team, to the board of the company. I think, yeah, being honest to yourself about the mistakes that have been made, both personally and as an organization. And also, yeah, sometimes if 90% of an idea are good, don't, and 10%, it needs to be 100% always. For massive success, everything needs to be 100%. But fixing the 10% with the excuse that it hasn't worked so far, it's giving up. And I think that's the, I think my key takeaway from the last few years, if you look at the products like Node and the success of the Circle and now how it continues with Integro, it has always been this kind of fight to fix the mistakes. I would not say that the next product is fixing the mistakes of the old one, but not, may, not wanting to reduce the quality or the value of the, let's say, earlier products. But in a sense, yes, every next product need to need to fix some of the issues of the previous and constant growth is, is yeah. As a co-founder of Synapticon, what recommendation would you give to new robotic startups in, in the market to their founders? I have been, I understand that many companies are from the very start pushed to deliver results quickly and that's okay. And at the same time, they're trying to keep the eye on the cost of the robot, which is also okay and imp very important for the long-term success. And sometimes because of this cost thinking, compromises are made that will jeopardize your ability to show a successful demo. And we need successful demos to get money from investors and uh, from our customers. So I would say, in your design, you should always think, can this be, can the same thing, my design, be made more cost effectively later on? Yes or no? The answer should be yes, but I should not do it first day. I should focus on proven components that work well. So I can re basically not, I can, the first prototypes or the first samples or the first demos I make are going to impress my customers. No one wants to see shaky robots, right? No one wants to see robots that don't perform or are unreliable, that are breaking down because of cabling issues or some other issues. So my advice, this is more like a CTO advice, is build on proven components, challenge your suppliers to make them more cost effective, and think about if the design has the potential to be produced cheaper. Don't look at the price of the component today because you will probably waste more time, have a 
unsuccessful demo and lose the trust. And this advice is particularly, in my opinion, important for robotics because robotics is so complex. There is a chain of components that's too long, it means that every component is a bottleneck. If one motor fails, the robot falls down, right? That's my advice to many starters. I have seen, we have seen a Synapticon, unfortunately, Several companies go crazy right from the start. We will make a plastic gear out by ourselves and make a robot with plastic gears. Maybe it's a brilliant idea, but what's the goal of your first few years? Your first years is to show that you have a viable business idea and a viable technology and then work on the cost. I'm by any means not saying you should not keep an eye on cost, I think today the majority of my work at Synapticon is thinking about cost reduction of our own products. But on the other hand, I see like many, when it comes to robotics, I see many companies struggling with unreliable robots and then failing to acquire the capital that they require. So we have Circular, we have Integral, we have the node drives. How does Synapticon support their customers through the full product life cycle? Yeah, so our standard um, components are suitable for design uh, of a robot system. This is one of the, our main strengths that so you can get up and running in a very small amount of time and is suitable for medium to high volume production, depending on the applications. Nevertheless, in some cases when the volumes go up significantly, it is common that we look at the requirements of your particular system and where you started using the standard components. And in the next step, we would optimize the system cost-wise, size-wise, requirement-wise, still keeping the core IP, the safety certifications, and then bringing it into the right shape for your robot. And we can accompany your development from the beginning to the end through the entire life cycle of your uh, project. So what if I wanted to know more about Synapticon or if I needed help choosing a drive or solving a robotics application or industrial application? So you can uh, approach Synapticon in many ways. If you want to have a live experience, we are exhibiting at uh, um, major exhibitions like SPS IPC drives in Nuremberg or Automatica. Also just a few weeks ago at and in Boston at, at the robotics exhibition. So check out our events. Then of course you're invited to come to our headquarters in, in Stuttgart, Germany. Yeah, we are happy to learn about your challenges, about your project, and our application team can help you find the right solution in terms of sizing and finding motors, gears, and every other component besides our own. Andra, thank you very much for joining us today. I uh, hope to see you back soon, and thank you everyone for watching. Thank you. It was a pleasure <laughs> talking to you. Hope to be soon again on this show. Great, thank you.